spake to Judas. One of the twelve came with him, a great multitude with swords and staves from the chief priests and elders of the people. And he that betrayed him gave them a sign, saying, Whomsoever I shall kiss, that same is he. Hold him fast. And forthwith he came to Jesus and said, Hail, Master, and kissed him. And Jesus said unto him, Friend, Wherefore art thou come? Then came they and laid hands on Jesus and took him. I want to preach for the time that is allotted unto me to this thought in our mind, overcoming the spirit of offense. Overcoming the spirit of offense. Overcoming the spirit of offense. There is a spirit that has ruined relationships. There's a spirit that has crept in our minds, caused us to miss out on good things. It has caused us to miss out on good people. It has caused us to miss out on good organizations, good opportunities. This spirit of offense that has crept into our hearts at times and crept into our minds caused us to do things outside of our Sometimes it causes us to do things that we would not normally find ourselves doing. Saying things that we would not normally find ourselves saying. Thinking things that we would not normally find ourselves thinking. It is this spirit of offense. This spirit of offense that creeps into our mind, creeps into our hearts, can sometimes take a stranglehold on what we believe. It takes a stranglehold on our mind. And it begins to shape and form and fashion our perception of things. Offense can make things that are not true appear to be true. Offense can make things that are not real appear to be real. Everyone here, I'm, I'm sure, under the sound of my voice, at some point in time has felt offended. And without any <laughs> research done on this, but I can attest that maybe 90% of the times that we felt offended, the offender did not even know that they offended us. As a matter of fact, there are times where we have offended people and we're not sure why or what we've done to offend them. Offense, at the risk of repeating, has ruined relationships, ruined companionships, ruined covenantal bonds between individuals. But we have to learn, as children of God, to be mature in our walk with Christ. We have to learn how to overcome this spirit of offense. Because if we're not careful, what offense will do will cause us to live a life in isolation when God has called us to a life of fellowship. Offense will have us closing our doors and shutting off the outside world. And in some cases, that is okay. But sometimes what we end up doing is we shut off the blessing that God has for us. It's all right to shut off those things that are negative. 
It's all right to shut out those things that can bring us down to be to our detriment. But sometimes in the shutting out of the negative, we end up shutting out the positive as well. Which is why we have to have a spirit of discernment to be able to discern when and why we may feel offended. To be able to discern what the intent of the individual was, what the intent of the organization was, what the intent of the trial is, what the intent of the trouble is, and not act upon the offense. We're going to feel offended. As long as you are living, you're going to feel offended. There's going to be moments where you feel offended. Some of it may be intentional. Some of it is by complete accident. But at the end of the day, we're going to feel offended. But Christian maturity tells me I should not react to the offense. I'll say it again. My maturity, my Christian maturity tells me that I should not react to the Christian, sorry, to react to the, to the offense. But what I should do is respond to the offense. There's a difference between reacting and responding. When I react, I have no control in what I do. If you go to the doctor and they hit you with the scallop on your knee, I believe that's what it's called, they hit you with the scallop on your knee, your knee is going to react and kick up if you got good reaction. <laughs> Some of you say, that's what it's supposed to do. Yeah, that's what, that's what it's supposed to do. <laughs> but when you respond to a situation, you are calculated in what you say. You are calculated in what you do. You are calculated in how you walk and how you talk concerning that situation. A reaction can cause negative things to take place. But when you respond, you are not responding or reacting from the place that was hurt. But you respond from the side of you that is whole. Let me say it again. A reaction is responding from the place that you've been hit. Reaction is responding from the place that you're hurting from. But responding is to take a moment to analyze the situation and respond from the side of you that is not injured. When Jesus said to turn the other cheek, he was not telling you to be a, a beating board for people. He was not telling you to sit here and be a punching bag for individuals. But what Jesus was saying was to respond from the side of you that was not hit. Because if I respond from the cheek that you slapped me on, I'm liable to slap you back. If I respond from the cheek that you punch me on, I'm liable to kick you in your face. But if I responded from the side that's not hurting, I can respond with love. I can respond with peace. I can respond with dignity. So when he says turn the other cheek, what he's telling you is don't react to what people do to you, but simply respond to the grace that God has given you and treat them how you would want to be treated in that situation. Doesn't mean I got to keep uh, taking everything you do to me because I only got two cheeks to turn. <laughs> I only got two to turn. And eventually I got to turn the other two and walk away from you. You'll catch that when you get home. <laughs> Hallelujah. To respond to your situation, right? Don't react. And Keys, where are you getting this from? When I, when I look at this particular chapter, this particular pericope of scripture, Matthew 26, where Jesus is being betrayed, he overcomes this spirit of offense. Think about it. Jesus has called these disciples. He's called an original 12 disciples. He called them out of their occupation, 
out of their lifestyle. Ask them to follow him. For three and a half years, they had intimate relationship with him. For three and a half years, they saw miracles that we don't even see in the Bible. Because one writer said that if the miracles that Christ had done was recorded, there could be no book to contain all of the miracles that Christ did. I believe John said that at the end of his gospel. It, they saw miracles that we don't even know about. They had an intimate privilege to walk with Christ. They saw him personally. They saw his divinity as well as his humanity. Jesus being fully God and fully man, they were able to see his divinity as well as his humanity. These 12 disciples, and of these 12, one of them betrayed him. And at some point in time, all of them denied him and walked away from him. When the 70 that he called came unto him and left him, the 12 still remained. Jesus had so much an intimate relationship with these 12 that he, he said basically, it's okay if those leave me. But he turned to them and said, shall y'all leave me too? It's all right if the, the 70 leaves me, the 500 leaves me, but, but y'all, I, I handpicked you. I called you by your name. Are you going to leave me too? There's one in the crowd known as Judas that betrays him. Betrays him for 30 pieces When he's offered you a mansion in his father's house. When he's offered you paradise. 30 pieces of silver was enough for Judas to betray the son of man. When he could have had something that would never rust. Something that would never tarnish. Something that would never fade away. For what does it profit a man to gain this whole world and lose his soul? He, as, as David said in Psalm 23, that the Lord is my shepherd and I shall not want. These 12 have experienced the shepherd. <laughs> they have experienced the fact that Jesus was the good shepherd and they should not want. They had no want. They had no need of anything. Not only did they have no desire or wants for anything, but God met every need that they had. One of these 12 betrayed him. Can you imagine? Being Jesus. After you revealed yourself to these individuals. You've opened up yourself. Everybody outside sees your divinity. But we, Jesus, have shown, or you, Jesus, have shown them his humanity. For it's easy to overcome offense from a stranger. What do you do when your brother has offended you? How do you deal when one that you have exposed yourself offends you? How do you overcome that? You're telling me something that's easy to do when someone I don't know talks about me outside of my name. But how do I overcome keys, the spirit of offense, when there's someone that I love? He's betrayed. And the truth of the matter is you can only be betrayed by a friend. 
you, you can only be betrayed by a friend. Which means this hurting that you feel can only come really by somebody that you exposed yourself to. This hurting that you feel can only come by from somebody that you have had a relationship with. That you've trusted, that you have put your confidence in. But sometimes we're going to be offended and feel betrayed. What do you do? Jesus could have easily done something. But look at it. When he's kissed by his betrayer. <laughs> just stab me in the back, Judas. J just take your sword and put it in my side, Judas. J just come up to me and slap me in the face. I can handle it better if I saw it come. But sometimes you're going to be betrayed and be offended with a kiss. <laughs> I thought it was all good. They, they, they kissed me on the cheek. I, I thought we were still great when they kissed me on the cheek. I thought we still had a covenantal relationship when they kissed me on the cheek. I can handle being punched in the face. Because now I know where we stand. But what hurts sometimes is when you're betrayed by an individual that kisses you on the cheek. Because I thought you had love for me. I thought you had compassion for me. I thought we was brothers and sisters. I thought we had a covenantal relationship. But what do you do when you're betrayed by a friend? By a loved one? Jesus shows us what to do in these moments. The first thing we have to do is don't take it personal. Even when it is. Don't take it personal. Don't take it personal. Yes, they hurt you personally. But don't take the offense personal. Because ultimately, this thing is not about us. Ultimately, there's a greater purpose to the offense that I have at the moment in my life. So what we cannot do is take it personal. Because once we take it personal, our feelings get involved. Our feelings get involved. Once we take it personal, we begin to react versus responding. When we take it personal, we look at it as an attack on who we are. Versus what we do or what God has called us to do. When we take it personal, we begin to put ourselves above the agenda of God. Above the will of God. And we begin to place ourselves as the forefront. But at the end of the day, we have to be reminded what Psalm 34, 19 says. That many are the afflictions of the righteous. But the Lord will deliver him out of them all. Don't take it personal. Even when it is. Don't, don't, don't take it personal. Even when the attack against you is personal. Because sometimes individuals just don't like you. Sometimes individuals just don't like us. We haven't done nothing, we haven't said nothing, haven't did anything to them that we know of, but they just can't stand us, but don't take it personal, even when it is. Because what we cannot allow, what we cannot allow is for the offense to take over us. Because if we're not careful, the offense can take over our mind, take over how we think, take over how we walk, how we talk, and ruin not only this relationship, but ruin future relationships. Don't take it personal. 
Because when you take it personal, you're giving the offense control over your life. When you take it personal, you're giving the individual that offended you control. <laughs> you're giving them control over your perception. You're giving them control over your feelings. You're giving them control over your thoughts. You're thinking about it, and they ain't even worrying about that. <laughs> you're losing sleep, and they sleeping good at night. Don't take it personal. Jesus responds. He says, friend. 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 Hmm. When he knew what Judas was doing, called him friend. As a matter of fact, he told Judas, is it about time for you to betray me yet? Looked at him and said, whatever you do, go ahead and do it. Whatever thou do, do it quickly. <laughs> Don't you got someone you need to be, Judas? He knew what Judas was doing, but still called him friend. You think that if Jesus took it personal, that he would have been able to call his betrayer friend? There's no way that you can, can call your betrayer friend, your offender friend, if we take it personal. There, there's something going on behind the scenes. I, I may not understand what's going on, but because of my spiritual discernment, there's something going on. I may not agree with why I got to go through this, but something is going on behind the scenes. He doesn't take it personal even when it is because Jesus doesn't allow his emotions to be controlled by his offender. He doesn't allow his emotions to be controlled by his betrayer. We are in charge and are in control of our emotions. Through the spirit and the power of the Holy Ghost. Without the spirit and the power of the Holy Ghost, we can have no control over how we respond. But because we have been dipped in the blood, because we have been baptized in the spirit, because we have been filled with the Holy Ghost, we can have control over our emotions. Because the truth of the matter is, it is not you with the control, but it is us yielding our spirit to the Holy Spirit and allowing him to control our emotions. Hallelujah. One of the fruits of the spirit is patience. To be able to endure what you're facing. One writer says to endure, Paul said to Timothy, endure hardness as a good soldier. Tell somebody, don't take it personal, even when it is. <laughs> don't take it personal, even when it is. Secondly, don't take vengeance. Tell somebody, don't take vengeance. Look, look, look what happened. Peter pulled out his sword, <laughs> pulled his sword out, and when the soldiers seized Jesus. Peter took his sword from his sheath, cut off the ear of one of the soldiers by the name of Malchus, cut his ear off, trying to defend Jesus, trying to fight this battle on the behalf of Jesus. Cuts off the ear of Malchus and instead of of Jesus turning to Peter and saying, good job. He then takes the ear and places it back on the ear of Malchus. He, he takes this, the ear that, that Peter cut off in defense of Jesus. Takes it, puts it back. Because 
Jesus, I'm defending you. Jesus, I'm going to take vengeance. Jesus, they when they come against me, they're coming against you. So I'm going to defend it because I don't want your name to go down. But Jesus says, you ain't got to do all that. He says, don't you know that I can call on my father? And my father can send down 12 legions of angels to defend me. Do you know what a legion is? A legion was 6,000. In other words, my father can send down 72,000 angels to defend me. And according to one particular scripture, one angel can defeat 180,000. And so if I got 72,000 angels at my defense, they can take care of 13 billion adversaries against me. I don't need you to defend me. My father can defend me. He he takes the ear. Malchus puts it back on his head. I heard heard, heard somebody say, he put the ear back on Malchus so he could hear the gospel. That's cute, but that's not why he did it. He, he put the ear back on the, on the head of Malchus to erase the evidence of Peter's vengeance. Mm. He, he put the ear back on the head of Malchus to erase the evidence of Peter's vengeance. Because ultimately what Peter was doing was going against the will of God. Because this was the will of God for Jesus to be betrayed. And had he allowed him to go against the will of God, ultimately Peter could have lost his salvation. Ultimately he could have lost the redemption that Jesus was getting ready to purchase for him on the cross of Calvary. And so what he did was he erased the evidence of Peter's disobedience. Because vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. And how dare I step in the way of God getting his vengeance. In other words, Jesus says what I'm going to do is I'm going to erase all of the evidence of your disobedience. I'm going to erase all of the evidence of your vengeance. And I'm so grateful that God will do that. Because there's been times in our lives where we felt offended and we told that individual our mind. We gave them a piece of our mind. But Jesus stepped in and repaired those relationships that needed to be repaired as if there was no evidence of our vengeance. Is there anybody here that's grateful this morning that can say, I know what it's like for Jesus to take away the evidence of my disobedience. The evidence of my vengeance, he, he, he took it away. Took the evidence away. Hallelujah. He took the evidence of my disobedience away. That's why you can sing the song that you've been redeemed. Because he took the evidence of your sin. Tossed it into the sea of forgetfulness. And now as far as the east is from the west. So is your sins away from you. Is there anybody grateful this morning that says he he, he took away. And removed the evidence of my disobedience. Don't take vengeance. Allow God to work. Take yourself. Allow God to work. Allow God to work. Growing up, my grandmother, whenever it was storming outside, she told us to sit down somewhere, turn the TV off, turn those lights off, sit down. We all gather in the same room. Couldn't even be in your own room. Everybody come sit down in the living room because the Lord is doing his work. She taught me something through that. That whenever God is doing his work, all I got to do is just sit down somewhere. We couldn't do anything. Couldn't play any games. Couldn't read any books. 
couldn't watch TV, had to sit in the dark and just let God be God in that moment. And that's what I'm asking you to do. That's my admonishment for you this morning is that let God be God. Sit down somewhere. Rest. Take your hand off of the situation and allow God to work in your life. He don't need your help. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I will repay. I can't help God repay what people have done against me. I can't help God repay the offense that has taken over my life. But instead, I got to learn how to sit down somewhere and let God work out the situation. Sit down. The Lord is doing his work. He's doing his work in your life. And he's doing his work in the offender's life. Sit down. Let him do his work. I don't need you, Peter, to cut the ear off of Malchus. My father can send a a legion of angels to defend me. Twelve legions of angels to defend me. I don't need you to defend me. Sometimes we find ourselves defending our name. I can't allow my name to be offended and then or de- or to be uh, going against. And what happens is uh, when we try to defend ourselves, uh, we make ourselves look worse than what we really were. Sometimes when you try to defend and avenge yourself, You muddy up the situation even more than what it was because my hands are dirty. And anytime I try to put my hands on the situation to clean it up, all I'm doing is making it more muddy, making it more dirty. Maybe I'm by myself here. But there's some situations that I wish I just left alone. There's some times where I just had to speak my mind. I wish I would have went down, went somewhere and closed my mouth. I'm going to tell them because they need to hear the truth. Yes, they need to hear the truth, but the truth sometimes don't need to come from you. Hallelujah. Don't take vengeance. I'm going to tell them. Touch not mine anointed and do my prophet no harm. Let God handle it. I promise he can do a better job than we can. Because if I touch it, a dirty situation is just going to become more dirty. But when God touches it, he purifies the situation. Because only God can touch something that's dirty and make it clean as if it was never dirty. You sitting there and that like you know what I'm talking about. But this same God had took our black souls, dipped it in red blood, and we came out white as snow. Is there anybody here that can testify and say, I know that God can take something dirty and make it clean as if it was never dirty because he did it in my life. When I was down in sin, when my life was marred, With the spirit of sin, God dipped me in his blood and I came out white as snow. Come, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, red like crimson, they shall be made white as snow. Hallelujah. Don't take vengeance. You don't got to defend yourself. Let God be God. Let him do what he does. Hallelujah. Let God be God. Hallelujah. You don't have to take a vengeance. You don't have to defend yourself. You do not have to defend yourself. Seriously, you do not have to defend yourself. I don't don't think y'all get me. You really don't have to defend yourself. 
Why is that keys? Because Judas is going to hang himself. You ain't got to say nothing to Judas. Judas is going to take care of himself. You don't have to kill Judas. Judas is going to hang himself. The lie that they told about you, you ain't got to kill it. It's going to kill itself. The rumor that they put out about you, you don't have to kill it. It's going to kill itself. Let God be God. The influence that the rumor had, don't worry about it. It's going to kill itself. But when I touch it, it brings life to it. Don't take vengeance. Thirdly, finally, trust in the sovereignty of God. Trust in his sovereignty. I know it hurts. You was offended by somebody that you loved. Trust in the sovereignty of God. <laughs> he tells Peter, I, I don't need you to do this. I, I don't need you to do this because, one, God is going to take vengeance for me. He's going to fight my battle. He's going to make his enemies his footstool. The scripture. He's going to make his enemies his footstool. He didn't say nothing about your enemies. He said his enemies. The Lord said to my Lord, sit thou at my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. He didn't say nothing about your enemies. He said he's going to make his enemies his footstool. I ain't got to worry about it. Because he's going to trample over what happens. He's going to trample over the offense. He's going to make it brand new for the one who was offended and the offender. You might not want to shout on that because you feel offended, but there's going to come a time where you are the offender. Y'all don't want to be real with me. But there's times in our life where we are on the other side of this message. And somebody is feeling offended by something we did. So the same grace that you want as, an, as, as being offended, you got to offer the same grace to the offender. There's going to come a time, there has been times, where we've been the offender. Hallelujah. Trust in his sovereignty. Trust in it. Trust in it. You don't have to offend it or avenge it. Just trust in his sovereignty. Why? Because he says here, Matthew 26, verse 56, he says, but all this was done. That the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. It had to happen. Judas had to betray me. It had to happen. So that everything in the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled. And just like in the life of Jesus, there are certain things in our life that has to take place so that the glory of God can be revealed. Doesn't mean it's going to feel good. Doesn't mean that you're not going to have an alternative agenda and wish it went another way. Matter of fact, you're not by yourself. Before this happened, Jesus was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, Lord, if it be thy will, let this cup, let this cup pass from me. But nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. It hurts. But trust in his sovereignty. Because ultimately, everything happens for a reason. Everything happens for a reason. Everything. We may not understand what the reason is. And here it is. We may not even agree with what the reason is. But everything happens for a reason. All of this, he said, took place. All of it. Every single bit of it took place so that the scriptures would be fulfilled. All of it. 
pain in your life, it all took place so the will of God could be perfected in your life. The tears, it all took place so the will of God can be perfected in your life. The sleepless nights, it all took place so the will of God can be perfected in your life. Because now I can look at God and not just hear about him being a keeper. I know he's a keeper. I don't just have to read that he will lift up my head. I know he'll lift up my head. I don't have to read about him mending the broken heart of the broken hearted because I am the broken hearted and he's mending my broken heart. Hallelujah. Had to happen and it's happening for the will of God so that God can get the glory. Hallelujah. There may be a, a different way that I want God to do it, but ultimately, it's for the purpose of God. All things work together for the good. He didn't say all things work together to make you feel good. And, and that's the, the lollipop Christianity that we have this day. He said, we, we have interpreted that as all things are going to work together to make me feel good. But that's not what he said. He didn't even say all things work together for your good. He says all things work together for the good. All things work together for the good. Of those who are called according to his purpose. Keys, you just said it. It's not, he didn't say it worked together for my good because my purpose or his purpose is not my purpose. Or my purpose is not his purpose. When I align myself with the purpose of God, I am no longer myself. It is not about what I want, but it's about what God wants. Then he goes on about four chapters later and say to be renewed. To be transformed by the renewing of your mind. In other words, give your will over to him. All things work together for the good. And sometimes the good that it's working together for makes you feel bad. But it's all right. As many are the afflictions of the righteous. But the Lord delivers him out of them all. Cast all of your cares upon the Lord because he cares for you. Hallelujah. Don't take it personal. I know you feel offended, but don't take it personal. If you take it personal, you react instead of responding. You don't have to take vengeance. God's going to fight your battle. And the only way we can do that is by trusting in his sovereignty. Tell somebody, just wait. Just hold on. A little while longer. Just, just hold on. I know you're hurting. But just hold on. I know you got to cry yourself to sleep at night. But just hold on. I, I know tears are filling your eyes. But just hold on. I know you want to tell them a piece of your mind. But just hold on. Let God be God. 